morning everyone and welcome to our session global opportunities in housing laying the foundation we have a full session for you so in the you know uh, next uh, uh, 90 minutes we'd we'll walk you through a lot of things the focus of the turbeliga center for um, innovation in shelter is you know which is a part of habitat for humanity international is to bring market based solutions for low income segment and our enthusiasm in participate in in sankalp forum uh, virtually this year you know uh, where we also get to uh, not just have uh, one co- uh, one continent but india and kenya and you know virtually also bring uh, folks from the us as well um, our enthusiasm was because we wanted to introduce shelter technology by this what we broadly mean is you know innovations for housing with an impact focus uh, and make this into a part of the discussion in this forum where you know there are a lot of participants from a variety of uh, walks of life and i think you know uh, sankalp forum should consider giving us the award for most speakers in the session at uh, sankalp already we we have a full house and we really wanted to you know get this uh, dialogue with a, a lot of uh, people because there are a lot of uh, perspectives we wanted to share uh, we'll kick off the session with a short intro by um, uh, patrick kelly who will give uh, a, a lot of data and uh, uh, inputs on right what we do and and what we are seeing based on our uh, research followed by view uh from investors on the opportunities and the potential they see to tap it so you know this is like a, a panel and a sort of continuation of this uh, panel you know uh, will be later and uh, we'll break it up with a brief intro on the shelter tech platform that uh, we have um you know uh, lizan will be giving that short introduction followed by the sort of continuation on the opportunities um as seen from the other side which is the housing entrepreneur and the ecosystem uh, support provider so it's really sort of like one panel but uh, broken into two pieces so that people are able to follow just a you know quick reminder also that this is not the only session we are doing we have uh, three more um, uh, coming up one is uh, tomorrow with a focus on um, india and uh, sustainable housing uh, the other two are on a friday in the theme of um, circularity uh, one is you know the um, african based uh, startups and you know um, how it could be built and then uh, we are also part of the plenary session so with that i want to um, introduce uh, 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 patrick kelly uh, who could not uh, join this morning because of the time zone difference you know he is uh, in the us uh, but he has a re- uh, shared a recorded uh, video with us uh, uh, patrick uh, has been with habitat for over uh, 14 years and he has a, a very strong uh, record in uh, sustainable uh, market development i will uh, request the sankalp team to play the video of uh, patrick kelly session i will stop the share the Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was willing to wake up early and join you guys. Um, some of the members of my team, I think, felt sorry for me and asked that I that I just record it. So I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm, I'm guessing almost everybody is watching this in a virtual context. Um, I guess it is the, the state of our world right now. But just as a, as a moments of levity this is the second recording i've made on this because i was uh, burst into a child burst into the room here asking me a question so i had to cut my my first attempt short um all to say i look forward to the day when we can be together again um i look forward to being in a sand kelp forum um and talking about housing and, and these topics So to get um, you started, first of all, just a big thanks to Sankalp and IntelliCap for putting housing on the agenda and allowing for 
some of this discussion to happen around impact investments and impact and housing. I'm super excited for that opportunity and the, the panels that you are going to be hearing from with Jonas and Lizanne. Um, so I'm going to share some slides and my hope is to just tee up to the topic of housing, um, housing at the base of the pyramid, pyramid and the impact and investment potential we see for it. So try to go full screen here. So again, I'm with Habitat for Humanity and this Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter. Think of this as the private sector development arm of Habitat. So um, we focus on trying to facilitate market-based private sector driven solutions for affordable housing. And the reason we do that is we are trying to respond meaningfully to the scale of the problem of inadequate housing. I think nearly 2 billion people live in substandard shelter. As an organization at Habitat, we kind of wrestled with this milestone we passed way back in 2011. So we, for the first time, served 100,000 households, um, which was a moment to celebrate, but we also lamented that that, that pace was just so insignificant to the, the grandeur of this problem and the fact that it would, would take us thousands of years at that pace to really make a dent in, in the size of that issue. Um, so we see an opportunity. We see an opportunity for the market to respond to, to the demand for housing. Um, there's some insights here just on that demand. Housing is the third highest category of spend among low-income households. Um, there's a huge opportunity in that low-income housing is overlooked by developers, investors, and financial institutions. Um, there's an opportunity in the existing housing stock as well as the opportunity of building you know, new homes um, through developments and, and large-scale finance. Most estimates suggest about $16 trillion is needed, and most of that is going to have to come from the private sector. Um, so there's really a big need for entrepreneurship, for investment, um, and for companies to, to play a role in this. Um, some of these numbers, by the way, come from the McKinsey Global Institute and a report on housing that they issued a couple of years ago. So now I'm going to introduce you to Ed and Gina. Ed and Gina are two people that we've met in the Philippines. We have asked them if they could be sort of a story that we are able to tell about um, some of this in incremental housing need that the people in the informal sector experience and they agreed. Um, so Ed and Gina built their home on their own, right? They, because they do not have a regular documented automatic deposit paycheck, they're unable to, to buy a flat or apply for a mortgage or do many of the things that the more formal part of the housing um, sector utilizes. So they built their home incrementally over the course of, of several years. Um, they do live in some, some, some substandard conditions. They have a crumbling foundation, uh, corrosion to the steel reinforcements in their walls, and the design of their home uh, keeps them vulnerable to some of the seasonal weather that the Philippines is hit by, particularly on the cyclone season. So the big idea that, that we are trying to advance, and we hope that the that your panels and discussions can is, is this what if, what if the private sector and actors in the private sector could meaningfully reduce the affordable housing deficit by focusing on creating value for low income incremental builders like Ed and Gina. So we think about the housing space and, and the market in three basic ways. Um, I'm starting from the right side of my slide. So financial inclusion, just the way people save, finance, borrow, access credit to pursue their, their home dreams. That's one, one part of the market that, that has a lot of opportunity and constraints that we're trying to address. The other is just the housing market system, the construction decisions, practices, norms, the labor markets, kind of that full tapestry that make up the, the opportunities that people interact with. Um, and then lastly, which is likely to be the, the topic on panels and in discussions, is just this opportunity for innovation and entrepreneurship. We are, are very optimistic that entrepreneurs and new ideas uh, have a big role to play in affordable housing. So just a couple of things to, 
to maybe center or get your thinking started. So we think housing has a huge role to play in the overall economy, and we think that's under measure. So we had some economists recently from the University of Washington and the Wharton School um, look at the housing sector and all of its components. So they looked at the construction market, housing services, and this, this informal part of the market that is almost always ignored. When put together, the three of those in most of these emerging markets is as big as some of the like the industrialized or um, manufacturing sector. So we, we think that that the housing market is often under considered as a place to, to consider for policy. So this paper is actually recommending that for a COVID-19 stimulus response that housing get a closer look. Um, another issue that we've been, been working on is just trying to bring some light to investors. I remember we had a really um, influential moment at the SEEP conference. Um, SEEP is actually a, a conference of practitioners and sort of the market development space. It was probably seven years ago or so that there was a panel of impact investors, some of the most influential and well-known impact investors in the world. And they talked about impact investing in a range of issues, education, financial inclusion, energy access, insurance markets. Um, so somebody from my team raised our hand from the back row or so, and just asked what the panel thought about housing. And it was met with relative silence. This, this panel of investors did not have much to say about this. So we've decided we want to just bring as much information um, and transparency and conversation to investors around housing as possible. So I would recommend um, you check out habitat.org slash TCIS, where we have all these publications, but there is a survey that we did of investors to just get a sense of their activity in housing. In summary, it's quite low, but interest is very high. A third piece I would point out to get to get your thinking going, and this is related to COVID-19, people like Ed and Gina, the incremental builders of the world, how are they coping with this COVID-19 situation? So we worked with 60 decibels in the Philippines. We're going to continue this in a few other countries just to get a sense of how people were, were dealing with this. Um, one thing that stood out in our analysis is that those who improved their homes recently um, through home improvement loans offered by a partner that we have there, they ended up being more likely to have a home-based income since the pandemic, if you can look at that third bar down. Now, again, we put an asterisk around this. This is a limited sample size. This is not scientific, but we think there's something there. People who are improving their homes are likely to be able to use those homes to generate some income in this social distancing world that we find ourselves in now. So ultimately, what we work on is what we have our heart attached to and what we'd like your panels and discussions to consider are the opportunities to connect homeowners like Ed and Gina, with a market that includes businesses and entrepreneurs like Shuram. Um, Shuram's with Modulus Housing, who is one of our accelerators for, for entrepreneurs in the housing space. Ultimately, what we're going for is we think when people have access to a range of market-based options, they are going to have more durable homes with waterproof walls, resilient design, clean water, access to latrines, sustainable sources of energy, access to, to more affordable financing and appropriate design advice. So as mentioned at the beginning, this is a vast market um, and with so much demand, we are going to need help from as many investors and entrepreneurs as we can get. So we are thrilled about the conversations that you are going to have today. Um, so I'll hand it over to those who are leading discussions, Lizanne and Jonas. And again, thank you all for, for joining us today and considering this, this topic that we think is, is of great import to the world and a great opportunity for those really working on this space of, of impact uh, and investing and in business solutions.
Okay, thank you so much for that, uh, Patrick. Uh, we will do a quick poll just to get a sense of uh, who the audience is so that, you know, the uh, later part of the discussion, we are better able to tune. Um, may I request the first poll be launched? This is just a, you know, very quick one, trying to get a sense of um, who you are. Okay, there is some brisk polling and some early votings, 60%. Yeah, maybe we'll uh, shoot for 70% and then stop at that point. It's not moving beyond 62 though. I'll wait a few seconds. Okay, 68, I, I round it up to 70. Okay, uh, 75, okay. So we will move on because you know we, we have a full agenda of okay, 80%, that's more than I hope for. So um, we can just uh, share the results. Okay, so I, I guess most tend to be ecosystem uh, supporters and others and uh, some entrepreneurs, not a whole lot. So, you know, th this will help the um, uh, speakers and the moderators to also tune the question accordingly. And uh, people feel that um, their interest has actually increased um, post COVID in the low income uh, housing market. And, you know, very few said it's a sort of um, reduce. So uh, thank you so much for uh, participating in, in that poll. With that, we move on to the next part, which is, uh, you know, the, the first panel session uh, moderated by uh, Jonas. Um, uh, Jonas Desfo is the uh, uh, co-founder of the um, uh, Pangia Accelerator. He's a partner with, uh, with the organization. He's been uh, helping us with the um, Kenya Shelter Tech uh, program. And uh, he is a very vibrant and energetic personality. So um, without uh, a lot of ado, over to you, uh, Jonas. Thank you so much, Mira. Um, I hope everybody can see me. Um, hi guys. Um, yeah, so my name is Jonas Tesfu. <clears throat> and uh, like Mira said, I'm a, a co-founder and CEO of Pange Accelerator. Our mission is to connect African startups with competence, network and capital. I have the pleasure of moderating this great session and also very uh, relevant session, specifically in these times of COVID-19. The thematics of this will be unlocking the market potential in affordable housing investment. And here I also have some truly amazing uh, panelists from three different places, I think, in the world. I think we are uh, very global in that sense. But um, I would like to introduce our first panelist. Um, her name is Jyoti Patel. She's a senior director of impact investment at the Tur Religious Center for Innovation in Shelter. Um, maybe Jyoti, you want to say a few words before I introduce the next panelist? Thank you, Jonas, and, and thank you for this opportunity to, to participate in this panel. Um, my name is Jyoti Patel, and I lead the impact investment team um, at Habitat um, within the Turbuligar Center, based out of Washington, D.C., and um, I'm very excited to, to speak here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jyoti. Uh, our next panelist is Jason uh, Musioka. He uh, works for uh, Victoria Ventures in Kenya and is Angel Network Manager. Uh, maybe, Jason, you could share a few, few words uh, about yourself. Uh, thank you, Jonas. Thank you everyone, for, for having me for this session. I'm looking forward to it. And like Jonas was saying, I manage an angel investment network. We largely look, look at early stage opportunities from an investment interest. And on that basis, we facilitate the investment conversation with the specific entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. And last but not least important uh, uh, is Aparna Dua. She's senior manager from Asha Impact. And I'm very happy to have you here with us also. I know it's very early in the US, but I hope everything is fine. 
I'm actually in India, but uh, thanks. Yes, uh, doing well. Thanks, Jonas. I'm excited to be part of the panel. Um, I guess um, quickly introducing Asha Impact. Uh, we're actually two platforms. One is uh, Impact Investing uh, Virtual Fund. Uh, we basically um, are a collection of eight different family offices who invest, uh, you know, across different sectors. But I'm also going to be wearing the hat for uh, so for both organizations. The second one is a policy think tank, which works very closely, and we've done a fair amount of work in the affordable housing space. Uh, we basically take you know, lessons of what's working on the ground from our portfolio companies and share that with the government to tell them what's working or, or what's not working on the ground and, you know, and hence try to create a much larger sectoral impact as well. And uh, we're doing, um, you know, some pretty interesting work in blended finance here as well. So when I, uh, you know, will be providing comments and just sharing my two cents today, we'll be wearing both hands, uh, that from an equity investor standpoint, as well as from blended finance and a policy standpoint as well. Thank you so much for that, Afana. Uh, perfect. Uh, welcome, everybody. And thanks again for participating in this session. My first question to you as investors, and specifically in terms of unlocking market potential in this very important space, is why do you invest in affordable housing? And, and what do you find attractive about it? Uh, we heard Patrick Kelly mention investors in his presentation, but I think it'll be interesting to hear viewpoint. Uh, feel free to, to, to start whoever feels like uh, sharing something. Maybe sure. Jyoti. Okay, Jyoti, maybe yeah, if you wanna go first. Sure, thank you. Um, I think Patrick really uh, partly the entire uh, reason why we, we at Terveliger Center are trying to find uh, market-based solutions to the affordable housing sector. So he mentioned Ed and Gina, and they are our typical protagonists. You know, they are the typical household that we serve. Um, they face both a crisis and an opportunity. Uh, they have, you know, sustained economic growth, um, has brought uh, millions out of poverty, uh, and has created a new middle class. Uh, but they have, and they have the means to invest in um, homes. However, as families migrate from rural to urban area. Uh, in search of economic opportunities. Um, it has led to rapid urbanization and, and, and a crisis um, in the affordable housing sector. Now take that and 1.6 billion people that are in need of affordable housing and overlay that with the COVID crisis. And there you have an absolute need, you know, to find solutions that are going to make Ed and Gina uh, more productive uh, and happier, healthier, family. Mm. So Patrick also mentioned about the, the, the number of interventions that, are, that we are doing. So uh, within the impact investment, uh, I uh, manage the $100 million microbuild fund, which provides access to affordable housing finance. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, on the supply side, we also fund entrepreneurs that are in the pioneer gap. So uh, when I, when I, Microbuild Fund started almost eight years ago, you know, as a demonstration fund. And the reason why we, we said that, you know, how um, Habitat as a housing company has, you know, a particular niche. We looked at the, the sector and, and realized that, you know, financial inclusion is great. If you look at also the investor spectrum, you know, people are investing in energy, they are investing in um, water, sanitation, and financial inclusion, and somehow, uh, in, it, it sort of spurned into the um, fintech sector. But if you look, there is very limited activity in terms of investor interest in housing and, and we have to explore that. So when we started this demonstration fund microbuild, it was a hundred million dollar fund. Um, and the idea behind it was to create um, a demonstration to make sure that housing can be both viable and a scalable opportunity. Um, at the low income household level. We found that eight years later, we have nearly done a turnover of $172 million in um, 55 institutions and 32 countries, including in India. So as a demonstration, we wanted to showcase to other investors that this can be a viable opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, we, you know, COVID kind of uh, hit. So we were in the um, 
middle of uh, negotiating or rather launching um, a housing note with a very large Swiss bank. Mm -hmm. um, and we put that on hold because of COVID. But point being that when you are able to, to create an opportunity where you can showcase that housing microfinance and incremental builds can both be scalable, financially viable, not just for the institution, but also for the investor, then mm -hmm. it is possible to have more funds flowing into it. Now on the, the supply side of the, the housing value chain, what we are seeing is that, you know, Ed and Gina may need a new roof, but the, 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 the lead firms or, or the, the typical manufacturers have just ignored that market. You know, even if they are in a position to pay for such roof, they are uh, languishing under a tin sheet roof and they could have better modular roofing or better, better sustainable roofing. So I think for us, these are not just opportunities, but um, also like, you know, creating an entire value chain system where we are able to bring to the, the larger investor spectrum that this is a space to invest in. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jyoti. And I think uh, being, you know, a first sector fund of its kind, I think it's very important creating success cases because then you can create this catalytic effect. So I think that's really great. And, and you also received uh, a fantastic results. So thank you for sharing that. Um, to you, Jason, working with business angels in Kenya, uh, how do you look at uh, affordable housing space and, and, and why do you engage in this sector? So for us, the, first of all, you're coming from a, sect, from a, from a country by traditionally, the housing market has already, has already been considered or, or seen as a very viable investment asset class. So coming from that, we still consider affordable housing one of the many sectors that are yet to be explored from an investment interest point of view, especially the way we look at it as private equity or venture capital investments. So we just need to change it, to change it. but the reason we believe it's a very good, it's still a viable sector is because of the fact that I think it's, housing is still a basic need for most people. Uh, until people discover how well people can live, I think housing is going to be uh, a basic need for most for most people. And you can see there's a very big opportunity from a deficit and from a gap on the supply side. So mm -hmm. being a basic, being a basic need, it's still a very viable investment avenue or a very viable investment uh, investment sector. And then secondly, also at least not contextualize it to bring it to a situation uh, there is already the the government agenda of making housing or affordable housing one of the big four agendas and on that basis of course uh, all investors will be looking at where the government wants to spend money and then once you see this government interest in a specific sector it in itself raises the investment interest that you have as as angel investors or or, 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 or other early stage or venture capital investors mm -hmm. so I would say those are the two main reasons why we still consider housing or affordable housing for that matter to be a very interesting sector for, sector for us to consider from an investment point of view. Mm. Thank you so much, Jason, and, and very valid point there. And I think also something you touch base on is the role of government, because if it is a government priority, you know the government is focusing on it and you know government spending will come then. Obviously, this is also uh, sending positive signals to investors. So I think that's a very valid point. Uh, my next question is for you, Aparna. And being an investor within affordable housing, I was just wondering, do you have any preferences in terms of the subsectors within affordable housing? It's such a big space, right? Are you within, you know, do you like the tech stuff? Do you like the material stuff, the circular economy stuff? What's your preferences on this? Sure. Um, so let me maybe, uh, you know, answer the first question as well. Um, so I think very similar to what Jason touched upon and what Jyoti talked about as well. The reason why Asha Impact, so we were only set up back in 2014 by uh, Vikram Gandhi and Pramod Pasing, uh, you know, two H&Is. 
Uh, but the reason why we chose to start our investment journey with affordable housing is because of the positive tailwinds from the government. Uh, they announced a flagship uh, program called PMAY, Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, uh, where you know big numbers were thrown around. That there's a requirement of almost 18 million houses in the affordable housing space, right? Uh, of course, when one starts to peel the onion, realize uh, you know. The numbers are, of course, much higher than the actual need. Uh, but even then, I mean, even if, it, if it's uh, not an 18, but, you know, say uh, in the mid uh, couple of million, that's still like a fairly large amount. Uh, so we felt, uh, you know, fairly positive uh, with the positive tailwinds from the government. Uh, there was also the National Housing Bank that was set up. We saw a couple of uh, affordable housing uh, players on the demand side as well. So NBFCs that were providing, uh, you know, finance to on the demand side. So they were very, very positive tailwinds. Overall, the real estate sector was doing fairly well. Uh, and we did see the big opportunity in affordable housing, right? And uh, with uh, the middle income folks as well, having a larger disposable income, uh, you know, we were seeing the demand fairly large over there, uh, which is why we felt fairly certain that uh, we wanted to play in this area. I think the second thing, uh, second point really from our thinking was that um, where is it that our capital could be the most catalytic? So similar to what Jyoti was mentioning, um, you know, unlike say other funds, we were happy to kind of, uh, you know, catalyze certain sectors and, and bring in more interest for other investors as well. So which is why we chose to play in the affordable housing space. Um, now to your um, you know other question of, of where we've invested so uh, we have invested in um, you know housing finance companies so we have two of those in our portfolio uh, one playing on the rural housing finance side the other playing in the peri urban or urban financing uh, side. And the other is actually an affordable housing developer. So we've not, um, I would say at this point, experimented with either circular economy or, um, you know, technology, but uh, I do feel, um, you know, and we can maybe go deeper into this in, in subsequent questions. I do feel um, there is a large scope for that, especially when one looks at India as a market for affordable housing. It's, uh, you know, there, there aren't necessarily one or two large players that one is talking about. It's, it's fairly regional. So aggregating demand becomes uh, very important if you want the, the kind of scale that Jyoti was talking about. Uh, we've typically seen, uh, you know, smaller players play in the in the regional space. So if one is really wanting to scale up and see the kind of returns that would attract more investment into affordable housing, there has to be a better mechanism to actually aggregate demand. And that's where I think technology can play a, a big role. And, you know, so can other uh, building materials, new technology for affordable housing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Apana. Very, very good answer. Uh, just a quick, quick question for you, Jason. Uh, from an angel, from a business angel perspective, which subsectors do you think uh, you know they find most interesting? What's your viewpoint on that? It's very difficult to really categorize it, but at least what you're seeing is how technology is coming to to do what Aparna just mentioned, that is aggregating demand and trying to see how we can create visibility in the different in the, in the different uh, components of, of the whole construction and build industry. So being angel investors, of course, I, I'm speaking from a very early stage investor perspective. I mean, we prefer things that, first of all, are very, they can enable capital efficiency as investments, and then also things like uh, asset light investments. So, and then largely we see how it's possible to scalability can be you know, high growth, high growth opportunities can be realized in the sector itself. So having said that, then it really comes in, it really comes, uh, it really means that uh, the main thing that we could, we could be looking at is, is early stage investors. And that is what actually you've already invested in is how does technology plug in and come and create efficiencies within that sector itself? or how can it come and start aggregating demand and bringing either backward and forward integration to enable more value to be unlocked in the different pockets of the build industry. Very good answer. Thank you for that. Uh, my next question is for you, Jyoti. Uh, because we're discussing unlocking uh, investment, right? My, my next question is, how do you make affordable more attractive for investors? And also, what do you think is holding it back? You are mentioning uh, 
to you know the micro build fund and so on. But what's your, what's your what's your take on this? So I think when we when we were looking at micro build fund, uh, there were three key barriers that we noticed. One of the one of the barriers is the access to to longer term capital. You know, people always associate housing as tying your capital for too long. Right. And mm -hmm. then uh, the second was uh, that there is um, lack of security of tenure, you know, there's lack of collateral. So if you look at a number of um, uh, house, uh, like in emerging countries, people don't have title to the land, even though they have lived on it for generations. And the third one was the, the, the lack of capacity for institutions, especially like microfinance institution or um, others that are engaged in, in providing capital to low income household was the ability to develop a separate loan product. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at um, when you look at the financial inclusion sector, I think it has done a great job in providing affordable uh, capital right towards yeah. micro enterprises. But when Absolutely. you look at families um, that are engaged in micro enterprises, these are typically loans that are for 12 months or 18 months at most. They also have a leaking roof. Now, it's always the capital is a constraint, right? So what do you do first? What people have done is in, in the research is that CGAP and World Bank has done is that although there is um, like $45 billion of capital, this is, uh, I think I'm quoting 2010 numbers, uh, there's only 2% allocated to housing, even though the leakage from micro enterprise loans towards consumption, mainly towards housing, is more than 20, 25 percent. Okay. So imagine the the cash flow mismatch, right? You are borrowing for a short term, and you are applying for a long term purpose. So our goal with Microbuild was to create such a vehicle. Mm -hmm. So I think the barrier that we we talked about is to just con continuing to dismantle them, right? Like so, for example, lack of secure tenure. What we are doing on the the supply side is to invest in prop tech companies, right? So they are. Um, they are uh, like re just last uh, week or 10 days ago, we invested in a company in Netherlands that provides digital land documentation by doing, you know, very innovative GIS, geographical information systems and GPS system, but also on the ground um, mm -hmm. uh, measuring of, of land and, and parcels, you know, that are divided between families and whatnot. And they have done this with one centimeter accuracy, right? And so they, they do this uh, mainly for the agriculture farmer to ensure the supply chain for the cocoa products or the sugarcane providers, but also for household, right? So we are saying if it works in agriculture, can we do this with financial inclusion, meaning engage financial institutions to be able to provide loan for secure tenure. So what you do is bundle the housing loans with the, 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 the tenure and then the, the tenure loan and then uh, create a bundled product so that people can get both um, loan to, to, to register their title, but also mm -hmm. to improve their homes. And our team in Asia Pacific have done this with an institution in Indonesia, for example, through uh, this company that we partnered with in Netherlands. You know, so our goal is to, to kind of create these kind of demonstrations. You know, we work with um, innovative companies that have, that are also sort of breaking the the typical mold, you know, they, like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you give people tin roof, that's all they will have as a product, but you invest in entrepreneurs that are creating alternative technology that are also cheaper and affordable, people will pay for them because in the end, people care for good housing and good solutions to their house. Yeah, I agree 100% with what you said. So um, investing in also solutions within the sector that can take down the risk, and then the other thing is investing in the entrepreneurs uh, as part of the problem solvers and somebody that keeps driving innovation within that sector. Thank you. Thank I think, you. Um, sorry, Jonas. I think also when you, it's not just finance, right? So when you have these other products, you look at housing and if people think of it as a barrier because it has such a long gestation period, that housing is interconnected with so many other ancillary uh, utilities, right? Water, mm -hmm. sanitation, education, health, and so on. And I think if, if we make that as core uh, proposition, then you address all of the other peripheral issues as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I see I that. 
um, if I can just come in, sorry, because I think I just wanted to raise a uh, you know point very similar to what Jyoti just mentioned, or I guess related, uh, is that you know we can attack the problem of affordable housing uh, through multiple lenses, right? So I, I think what Jyoti's point on the wraparound services or looking at other services as well along with housing, I think is, is a absolutely brilliant point, which just triggered this thought. Uh, we're starting to see some amount of innovation, uh, you know, in the blended finance space as well. And I just wanted to kind of raise that in the panel as well. Um, you know, so two specific instances. One, um, you know, something that was tried a couple of years back in the U.S. and was fairly successful. Uh, this was done by uh, Social Finance U.S. They were trying to... Um, you, smiling so you probably are aware of the impact bond that I'm talking about but it was not just you know providing habitat or a shelter to people but also wraparound support services and because of the target on or the focus on outcomes over here that we need to ensure that people have shelters the program was immensely successful and now we're trying to see if that can be scaled up to say other markets as well. So that's just one example that I wanted to bring into the discussion. Um, and then similarly in India, you know, when, when one's looking at the affordable housing market, uh, you know, Jyoti brought up the point of developer finance. That's absolutely critical and something, um, you know, very hard to access even for developers over here. What we are trying to see is people have started to unpack that. Uh, now under a developer, you have multiple layers, right? Between the construction workers and the developer itself. So you have your subcontractors and contractors and there are all these middle layers and that there, there are a lot of working capital issues in at these layers as well. Um, so not only is access to finance a problem, but those who are able to access finance get it at really exorbitant rates. Um, mm -hmm. So again, through blended finance, we're trying to see if, you know, working capital facilities can be unlocked because there's always going to be this mismatch that, you know, uh, money is coming in and it's not matched with the tenor. So can patient capital take in some of that risk, take a junior position and you have more senior investors come in, uh, you know, to create a blended capital stack uh, mm -hmm. and then solve for some of these financial issues at the microcontractor level, maybe even at the developer level. So that's something that we're starting to see in India as well now. There are a couple of organizations that are, uh, you know, trying to piece this together. I think this is very interesting and, and, and experimenting and trying different models. You mentioned blended financing. I think this is also needed to kind of unlock financing uh, yeah. that we, we will need to do some innovation and testing in terms of what vehicle that works best. Uh, I see here that Unfortunately, the time is running away from us. Uh, I'm getting a dead dead stop in two minutes. I'm going to ask you, uh, uh, basically, if you could spend about 20 to 30 seconds to maybe do a quick summary on what do you think is needed to unlock more investment in affordable housing? Uh, maybe we could start with uh, Jason, and then we could do Jyoti, and then finish with Aparna. Is that okay? Great. Jason, up to you. Leave it to you. <coughs> I'll try to keep it to 30 seconds. So I think one of the things that is really important is for, to get the kind of collaborative collaboration with different kind of investors, like Apano was mentioning, the ones that are looking at different sort of investment instruments to come in and couple up with private, private equity capital that is more patient. And then on that basis, you can unlock more value for, for, the, for the opportunities. And also try to look at how does automation play a part in enabling uh, more, enabling a better be, uh, a more better efficient system to be to be unlocked whereby you can just do you can do forward or backward integrations within by through automation and then on that basis you can you can you can extract value from different from different segments of the sector mm. thank you so much jason much appreciated uh jyoti uh, what Just you... continuing to demonstrate, I think uh, we are very lucky as Habitat, as, as, as we have had a really solid brand name, you know, so we, what we want to do is continue to demonstrate opportunities uh, through the Shelter Venture Fund and through um, maybe a second microbuild fund, maybe, uh, you know, once when we, uh, that now that we have demonstrated, and I say this uh, yeah. not very lightly, you know, J uh, Jonas, this particular crisis has put such a dent, right? And mm. yet we see a resilient fund like Microbill continue to sustain and mm. showcase that people will are not willing to lose their home 
they 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 will do everything they can to keep their their home and their their health together and i think so for us it's the ability to be able to showcase that when you have a good technically sound product there is very little room for failure perfectly uh, summarized so thank you so much uh, so we heard the summary from jason and jyoti and now i'll leave it to aparna yeah, I'll make a uh, quick three points to summarize. I think, um, you know, continue to innovate on the finance side. So definitely you know, explore blended finance options to, uh, you know, see how you can seed more entrepreneurs and uh, help builders. The second is the point of the demand aggregation that I made. I think if you want to scale up, uh, you know, affordable builders definitely have to look at technology to support them to do that. Um, the third is, um, you know, integration, backward integration. So even if, you know, there are some entrepreneurs who are um, slightly smaller, if they can tap into the industry, the larger builders, and see if their product, their material can, you know, uh, be accessed by these builders, again, that would provide them sort of B2B solutions for the product that they're innovating on. I think these three things would definitely help, um, you know, scale up the market. Perfect. Thank you so much, Aparna. And thank you so much, all the panelists. I think this has been great. I wish we had more time. I think you've done a great job. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we've been, you've been hearing from experts based in the US, India, and Africa during one and the same session. So I think this has been uh, very, very good. So thank you so much. I will now leave it to Mira. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas, uh, for this uh, very fast paced uh, session. Really, you know, we, we were um, thinking, you know, when we were given uh, 90 minutes, what we would do with it. But just now, it doesn't look like 90 minutes is enough, you know, given this <laughs> session. I also want to note, you know, Jonas, we, we were going to have one more panelist, Alexandria of um, a New Story, right, which um, has made um, investments in uh, the housing space. And she's also an entrepreneur. She could not join because she is on the West Coast in the US and it, it was just like 3.30 a.m. So um, otherwise, you know, this session would have been longer and, uh, you know, that uh, uh, we, we want to thank her for accepting only that it, it just didn't work out uh, timing wise. So we will do a quick poll. I want you all to save your questions a little bit or, or type it in the chat. Um, so if we could do the second poll now um so that we, you know again we are able to get a little bit uh, more information on the participant and and be able to uh, tune this so we'll uh, keep polling until we hit some 60 percent or should i get a bit Greedy for <laughs> 70, 75 percent. Let's see. Uh, we also have to keep a tab on time, right? We better listen yeah. from a lot more panelists. We have uh, entrepreneurs and uh, ecosystem support providers um, and uh, Lizanne. Uh, 65 sounds good. Maybe a few seconds. Okay, I think we can uh, close the poll and see the results already. So, um, interesting. Interesting, yeah. That uh, many are, you know, we have very few who have uh, uh, low interest, and uh, and uh, many of them feel that um, investors do feel. I mean, you know, um, a yes and a no are pretty close. Unsure is a lot, so I think um, you know that's a good point to probably you know for uh, uh, Lizanne to deliberate on. Uh, so I will move on to the next session, which is really in my mind, a continuation of, of this. Instead of having one large panel, you know, I thought we would have, uh, have it split up. And um, so I want to introduce uh, Lizanne, uh, who's um, Associate uh, Director of um, Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Habitat for Humanity. She comes with a, a lot of um, experience and um, she has been you know, a, a builder of the uh, ecosystem, particularly in the impact um, investment space. She'll walk us through a brief intro on the uh, Shelter Tech uh, program. 
and then um, run a panel on um, uh, with the entrepreneurs and the ecosystem uh, support here. So over to you, Lisa. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Mira. And hi, everyone. Um, I would still need to have sharing um, admin role, please. Request to the Suncalp people. to share my screen. And until I have that, um, I will say, hi everyone. It's wonderful to have you here also virtually. Um, and I think if we make a small change until I, now I have it, great, thank you. Okay. Very happy to have you all here. It's interesting to do a virtual um, conference. And before I actually would like to start with um, our short intro to Shelter Tech, I would like to ask this question. So can you actually identify the sound? And please write in the chat box. Do you recognize the sound? What is the sound all about? I see some. <laughs> I'll play it once more. Exactly. So I have a lot of um, answers here. Thank you so much. Exactly. So this is the 56k modem dial up. And the interesting thing about this is that we connected to the internet 28 years ago with this sound. And, you know, the ones which are younger, imagine how the world was then. And for the ones who are a bit older, remember how the world was back then. And in a, it's amazing what happened just in three decades to come to today, what is happening today. So innovation is a absolutely key part um, in, in our lives, in how we behave, in how we live. And of course, also in the housing sector. So as shelter tech, and also as TCIS, we are, as you've also heard before, focusing very much on the entrepreneurial solutions and on the entrepreneurs itself, who need support and need um, also investments to grow, to actually help and, and shape the world we are living today. And why are we doing this? Also, as you've heard from Patrick and, and my peers, is that we are trying um, to help the nearly 2 billion people who still live in the inadequate shelter. And I think this number can't be said enough times. There are so many people out there who we still can um, target and, and um, serve to. So as said then before, um, TCIS is supporting the shelter-based entrepreneurs to scale their innovation and shelter tech is doing this in a very specific way. So we are the world's leading platform for affordable housing innovation. So for affordable housing innovation, where we want to advance entrepreneurial shelter solution that will improve lives of low income families. So we are very niched and we would love to have you also joining our journey. One of our quite ambitious goals is we want to make housing one of the top five impact investment categories. As Jyoti um, and, and, and Jonas um, said also before in the panel, um, there is still much we can do. There's already a lot of hap um, things happening, but there's still you know, quite an opportunity um, in the space. Shelter tech, where did we do 
what. So we completed um, three accelerators in Kenya, India, and, and Mexico. Right now, we expanded then to regions. So we are now in Southeast Asia and the Andean region. And we are planning to launch also shelter tech accelerators in the United States of America and also East Africa. Highlights to date um, for shelter tech. So we, so far, so in India, Mexico and Kenya, we um, accelerated also with the help of Pangea, um, with Jonas, 47 startups with our accelerated programs. We invested um, in nine startups globally, and we also gave catalytic funds to 11 startups. As shared before, Shelter Tech is a platform, and we will be speaking about platforms also afterwards in the, in the panel. Um, so we are having different activities and initiatives to help and support entrepreneurs. One of the major things we are doing are the accelerators. So what are the accelerators within the Shelter Tech? So we really have a program which lasts almost a year. Um, we are right now in Southeast Asia and in the Andean region um, where we're selecting 10 startups um, who will then be joining our two regional accelerators. And what we are doing is really to give support so stage agnostic support to startups and scale-ups. So we are funding them with catalytic funds. Um, we are providing um, different connections. And of course, there is also an inv a possibility um, that they will receive investments through our shelter venture fund, which is with Jyoti, as you've heard before. I would like to go a little bit in depth also with um, where we are at um, with the sector. So we are, of course, um, targeting housing entrepreneurs, which has to do with, with the roof, with the walls, which ma with material, um, but then also with labor, um, with finance, land, and, and, and market solutions. And then also um, very important services and the light services, which include water and sanitation and also energy. And as Patrick said before, we cannot do this alone. So we do have um, donors and partners, and of course, um, our anchor partners within the regions. And we would love to have you as well also a part of our endeavor, um, that housing really becomes one of the top five impact investment um, categories. And because um, we are now already very used to this audience pool, let's do one more. So I'll give you quickly a little bit of time to read through this. So Mira, we are going up quite fast. I can see already 30%. <laughs> Yeah, and, and this one is, uh, you know, longer and, and tougher questions. We sort of started out with easier questions first. And who are you? And now we are asking more tougher questions that um, try to tease out a lot more information. So yeah, we are over 60%, Lizanne. So you can take a call on what's your magic number. I think one more. Okay, I'll end pool now. Thank you. Yeah, so we see you um, also based on this pool that availability of funding is still um, something founders are seeking for. And that's why I also would love to go into our panel to talk more about this. So thank you very much. And yeah, and it's also interesting, nothing is so low, right? Even pilot and mentoring, you know, Everything is, is no, nothing is like 5%, 10%. So yeah, lots of questions to discuss. So 
I would like to introduce you to our next speakers in our panel. Um, the first one is John Kuruvila. He's the chief mentor of Brigade Reup. We have Ryan McPherson. He's the portfolio and investment manager of Autodesk. We have Shiram Rafichandran. He is the CEO of Modulus Housing. And we have Linus Vahome, founder of Manpro Systems. Um, I would love to give the speakers a quick um, few seconds to introduce themselves a bit more in depth. And because this is a virtual session um, and we, you know, we will not know each other as good as we would we, if we would have a drink after the sessions, I would love also to hear a fun fact about each speaker. John, please start. Yep. Hey, thank you, Lizanne. Thank you, Mira, for having me here. Uh, we are part of Brigade Reap. Uh, Brigade is one of uh, India's largest real estate companies. We were the first uh, prop tech accelerator in Asia. We've mentored uh, 33 startups, 42% have raised funding, 150% uh, is the year on year growth of these startups, and they're solving real problems. Uh, problems that are impacting the environment, problems that are, are addressing serious inefficiency in the real estate uh, market. Uh, thank you, Lizanne. Uh, happy to contribute uh, as, as, as things progress. Thank you so much, John. Ryan, what's the like fun fact? Oh yeah, what's the fun fact, John? <laughs> so I'm a I'm a, a farmer uh, over the weekends, and I'm growing um, a lot of stuff, which is zero residue farming. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Ryan. That's a pretty fun fact. I'll. Uh... I, I, for one, am not a farmer, so I'll, uh, I'll leave that, that skill set to you. But in, in my world, so my name's Ryan. I, I lead impact investing over at Autodesk. Uh, we're a large $50 billion market cap company that we make software for people who make things based out in Silicon Valley, out in here in the United States. Um, and so when I say people who make things, think architects, construction managers, product de uh, developers, uh, engineers, game designers. It sort of runs a gamut. Anything that requires design and making in a three-dimensional environment, Autodesk likely has some sort of product for our customers to do some awesome things. Um, in our impact investing work that I lead, uh, we're investing in early stage companies on the innovation side of that spectrum that we talked about in the first panel, uh, using the Series C, Series A level, uh, that are using design and engineering to address some of the world's most pressing problems. And we define those as, as climate change and inequality, both of which really manifest in this issue around uh, what we call afford, uh, housing affordability. So you know, moving beyond like uh, affordable housing as perhaps a specific sector, thinking a little bit more broadly about how to drive more efficiencies throughout that entire value chain and, and push those savings on to consumers, thus leading to, to housing affordability at the end of the day. Um, you know, for me, a, a fun fact, uh, tomorrow is election day here in the United States. Um, so folks are sort of sitting on pins and needles it's also my birthday tomorrow, so uh, I know we're not able to get together as a collective group here and to, you know share drinks. But uh, I'll add that to the tab of things that you guys, uh, you know, you can certainly buy me a drink next time we're all together. And and either it'll be a celebratory one based on the results of this election, or it can be one of mourning. But uh, but yeah, thanks for joining. Or thanks for for hosting. I'm, I'm super pumped to be joining everybody here. Absolutely, and and if you give us your email or the audience your email we will for sure celebrate you and, and send you some fun gifts <laughs> <laughs> thank you Sri Ram oh you're still on mute hi yeah. good evening everyone my name is Sri Ram I'm founder of Modest Housing so we do prefabricated structures and we can we do structures that can be deployed in just less than four hours we build a house in just less than four hours just like IKEA for construction so that's what we do Right now, due to COVID, we have started doing medical facilities as well to supplement our health infrastructure in India in rural areas. This is what we're doing. Fun fact is, uh, not much, but yeah, I'm actually sitting inside a car and I'm doing this. But it's just fun for me to find a good uh, meeting space. So I'm just traveling and I have to hang on over here. So. so you're on the road, right? Yeah. I thought you're in the same room. Yeah, that explains a little bit the back no the, the background noise. Thank you so much, Sri Ram. Linus, are you here too? My name is Linus. Um, I'm Systems, uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya. 
So what we do is we automate the construction industry. We basically help people to build um, you know, the more, uh, in a more affordable way by increasing productivity and efficiency uh, in the construction sites. So um, basically what we do is to fill the information gap that is there in the construction industry using technology. For a fun fact, um, I think I was privileged to sleep once on the same bed that Queen Elizabeth slept on. Uh, we went for a company event and uh, they had overbooked and they had to put me in this prestigious room. So, <laughs> yeah. I'll remember that fun fact too. Thank you so much, you. Linus. I mean, we are all virtual and in front of our computers or our phone because we are we live in a very special time, right? COVID um, is everywhere, not just in the news, but also what gives us some hurdles um, in our life, but maybe also some opportunities. Um, John, how do you see now, you know, the, the challenges and, and also opportunities um, through these changes and disruption through, through the virus within your ecosystem? Well, uh, COVID has been a phenomenal uh, a boon for prop tech startups. While it's been a bane for the real estate industry and many other industries, uh, the real estate industry, which was plagued with inefficiencies, suddenly woke up to the fact that they have deployed very, very little technology. And we started in 2016 and we used to go from builder to builder saying, listen, we got a great uh, prop tech uh, startup solving a problem. And we used to get a fairly lukewarm uh, reception. But from March onwards, our phones have never stopped ringing. Uh, 33 of our startups have been exposed to close to 3000 real estate developers, all vying for prop tech startups to help solve their problems. And what's better, Lizanne, is that seven of our startups, as of yesterday, we got another startup, have raised funding during COVID times. So this is a phenomenal opportunity for both the real estate industry to adopt technology and for the prop tech startups solving pressing problems to actually go and grow in the market. So I think, I think phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity. And I think virtual has worked for all of mm -hmm. us. Thank you, John. Do you think also this, so first of all, congratulations also on the success of, of, of you guys and also your startups. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing to hear and I think we are all ready to hear some good news. So thank you for sharing this. Um, why do you think it increased actually, you know, the success as well? Do you, do you think it is also because the need of more digitalization or um, about innovation per se, or what specifically was the, 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 the success ingredients? Okay, so uh, historically, you know, I remember in 2017 when I stood in front of a real estate forum and I said, this industry is very, very inefficient, 80% uh, of your projects are delayed and 80% over budget. I was literally booed by the industry. I still remember this, you know, and I said, listen, this is not my information. This is a McKinsey report. And today that reality has come to haunt them because India got hit with four tsunamis. RERA, mm -hmm. GST, demonetization, seriously impacted the real estate industry. And COVID, I think, dealt a near death blow. And real estate developers woke up to the fact that in this new environment, they have to cut waste. And I'll give you one data point, uh, Lizanne, which shocked me. Do you know that for every degree increase in temperature, the, the increase in cost is 4% to operations. Water in Bangalore, costs have gone up by 32% annually. Waste cost has gone up by 100% every 10 years. And this is impacting real estate to the tune of $2.5 billion every 15 years. That's a lot of money, which is waste. And a lot of prop tech startups are today coming and saying, listen, I will solve that for you. And we will do a success-based fee. And that's working extremely well. Thank you so much for sharing. Ryan, how do you see that Autodesk? Um, what were the changes also in the last couple of months? I, I'd yeah, love to just build from what John had mentioned, you know, in terms of just waste that we're seeing in this sector, it's been no surprise to folks that, you know, construction and, and the real estate industry might be some of the most wasteful in the entire world. 30% uh, of all of waste globally comes from the construction sector. And if you actually walk by 
any sort of commercial or residential project, you just see you know, how much material and, and time inefficiencies are just wasted. Uh, and so what I, I actually am seeing something quite similar, which is in a moment of macro disruption, like you're seeing from COVID, a lot of our customers or our customers' customers are actually thinking quite purposely about how to be able to drive efficiencies in their entire workflows and, and across their supply chains and looking towards technology to be able to do it. I think what you're seeing now, perhaps that was a little bit different from what you talked about before there, John, is uh, an interesting supply side of entrepreneurs that have you know, grown companies, had uh, those companies have success and some liquidity that flows back into the system and, and grown sort of the supply side of entrepreneurial activity here. I think now we're in this moment of disruption, you're seeing some more market pull from organizations that traditionally would be slow to adopt new types of technology. So on a net, like I would say, our construction customers tend to be about 20 years behind what we're seeing on the manufacturing side. And you're taking a lot of the best of manufacturing and now applying it in the construction realm. Thank you, Rian. Um, Sriram, we also saw that you pivoted a little, a little bit um, during you know, the pandemic. Could you share a little bit how, how you, you know, how the last couple of months were for you and uh, modulus housing? Sure, yeah. So uh, we started off by doing uh, portable accommodation for migrant workers and uh, the more migrant uh, crowd in construction sites and oil and gas and mining, those kind of industries. And when COVID hit us, the construction sector took, a, took the biggest blow. Like the, the on-site activity fell from 100% to just 5% or 10%. That is when compared to March or February in India. So that is when we understood there is a, no market there and we had to pivot, at least for the short term. And we also realized there is a huge need for health infrastructure. So the advantage of working in affordable housing is that you crack ways to do houses or shelters in a very cheap way, which can be replicated in other areas as well. You can build cheap health infrastructure, cheap uh, livelihood centers and so on. So that helped us. And we partner with few institutions at national level to launch Medicab, a COVID-19 instant health facility with negative pressures and so So we understood the fight against COVID for India is going to be uh, dependent on its weakest link, that is the rural areas where there was no infrastructure in the first place. So what we did, we did prefabricated hospitals, that is uh, generally to open a hospital in India, it takes months or years of regulations and investments. So when you prefabricate it, when you productize it, so the whole clinic becomes a medical device or like a product and you get all the certifications once and that can be applied for all hundred or thousand or whatever clinics you launch. So that helped us to revolutionize it and also since it's a temporary structure, the paperwork required was very, very minimal. So that helped us to launch clinics in three different states and we're launching a hundred bedded facility and so. And that also opened up a few more opportunities like uh, right now we're working on a product called AgriCab. So the Medicab was for medi medical and AgriCab was for more for farmers and so. Again, the same technique of housing, affordable housing help, helps us over here to build affordable livelihood centers like micro factories and so. So this uh, post COVID when the housing market revives back, this will help us create a small township with all, all the medical livelihood facilities and also shelter facilities. So this has been a great learning curve for us. And uh, this is what we've pivoted into right now. We do Medicab and AgriCab. And I mean, for, I mean, for startups and founders, um, you are in an earlier stage, you're doing a lot of different things, right? At the same time. And um, capacity issues is beside of like funding one of, of the, the key mm -hmm. topic how did you have the capacity to actually or why did you also feel the need to to pivot a bit your your business model so uh one major hit was that uh the construction sites as again uh is not going to observe any orders or they don't require any new uh shelters on site because there's no migrant workers in the first place over there who's working there so that required one so you had like three times suddenly you were like oh there's no business what else can i do with my time <laughs> Yeah, one is survival instinct, right, of course. <laughs> and also the need to do something. Uh, the whole idea of modulus housing uh, came out of a disaster. Our, our city, Chennai city, was hit by a major floods during 2015. And that is how we developed the whole of modulus housing. We developed the rapid shelter system. And when another disaster hit us, it was more of an instinct and gut feeling to go after it. When you have a right product, which can add value over there. So we thought, okay, why not? And it was just a 
trial and error because again there were so many people doing such excellent work like the doctors and medical workers and so so we just wanted to add whatever we could and uh, most of the credit goes to the team so it was the team which came up with the idea and they told why not we do it we have so much ample time so again the the options are pretty much uh, very simple one is netflix and bench or do something productive so we went the other way and uh, yeah that turned out to be good for us for the team and for the ecosystem that we've been working on thank you very much for for sharing this viram and as you are sitting in a different part of the world um how did covid affect you you're still mute linus you're muted apologies yeah so i was saying um just like any other part of the world i think uh, construction was uh, also affected here um although there wasn't like total uh, close down of construction work there was a huge uh, you know slow down um and that of course impacted uh, you know the the way in which people were able to uh, deliver projects i think one of the greatest challenges that we are seeing is not actually the ongoing projects but probably what will happen um in the next year or two because uh, there hasn't been a lot of negotiations and contracts being signed over this uh, period so um i think what will happen is we will see uh, the impact of this will probably be in a year or two from a construction point of view uh, but on the positive side of things is that um we are dealing with an industry that is very um almost anti technology mm -hmm. uh you know what what you find is that uh, very many developers contractors um indi uh, individual uh, de developers they are very manual in how they manage projects and one of the challenges we had pre corona was um as john said it was very difficult to get people to you know even just do an online meeting was was a big challenge um but right now i think there has been a, a great appreciation of technology uh just from the simple fact that people can have meetings online uh, a big majority of contractors would not think that they can manage a project without stepping to the side um that has changed uh, with corona so i think what uh, covid has done for us is that it has opened us it has opened up a space that uh, enables us to sell and talk about our solution in an easier way as compared to pre corona thank you so much linus hey, would please, you like please, um, do, you, do you mind if i turn the table and ask you the similar type of question i'm curious because you kicked this session off and talking about the platform that is shelter tech and and these sort of wrap around services to help support the entrepreneurial ecosystem here i'm curious for you in some of the portfolio organizations you've been supporting um are are you seeing those needs change because of covid and and how are you thinking about it from where you're sitting on the platform side i mean i think um i think one of the question is also like how how are we moving all together forward right what are the questions the questions are shifting um before we had um certain types of questions now we have new um types of questions and one of one of the biggest question is as well like how do we make sure that the startups who are serving also the beneficiaries of from our side can be supported even more um and how can we make um or how can we engage even more the investors to join this table um to invest more in housing entrepreneurs um i mean again the numbers speak for themselves there are a lot of research papers on the table but still we don't see the pick up um uh of the investors to 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 join us and um that's why we are putting a lot of emphasis also on, in our accelerators or to be talking also at such an important events as for example suncult right but now with our um with our accelerators we are not just accelerating the the startups by giving mentorship or you know connections as a lot of accelerators are are doing but um we are giving them also catalytic funds um the startups so we are we are trying to raise also money so we can distribute it to so we have the possibility um to pilot even more 
And we are emphasizing also a lot on, of, on partnerships, you know, with the corporates like Autodesk, <laughs> the organization you're sitting in, um, because we see also the need that um, startups want to pilot and, and create partnerships or proof of concepts um, to move forward, because then they do understand even better the market. And the startups also help corporations to understand the market or an, an, an additional market even better. So. We, we, we see there also a little gap which we can fill as well with our um, with our work. But Ryan, maybe a question again back to you. Like, um, I mean, we are partnering up, like, but how, why are you actually partnering up um, with, with different organizations as well um, to bring affordable housing forward? Yeah, you know, I, I, it's been kind of interesting just hearing from Sriram and, and Linus who have, you know, sort of pivoted their business models or in, and are thinking about what the new world order will look like with their technology solutions in this space, because I do think there's so much opportunity here in housing, looking forward from disruptions like COVID to drive more efficiencies in what is traditionally so fragmented. Um, so the opportunity is huge, it's fast, right? There's gonna be 10 billion people on this planet. And so there's there's a fundamental need to drive innovation in the sector. And um, the way in which we've built in the past cannot be the way in which we build in the future. And, and it's sort of a collective understanding from, from everyone. Um, that being said, it, it's really hard to do uh, for many different types of reasons. Some of which I think you just mentioned there, Lisa, on which is you know, how do you do so and pass those efficiencies down uh, to full mass market adoption when you know the, there is fragmentation and therefore a perception of increased costs uh, across different parts of that your, your business. Um, so how do you really focus on the beneficiaries at the end of the day and, and be able to to really get to mass market adoption uh, when you're looking to do something as a disruptor like Linus or Shriam here um, within a fragmented space. So if I for one am a big component of not only being able to, you know, for our impact investing practice, put capital to work in individual companies uh, and bring to support beyond just capital, right? And for Autodesk, that takes form in our technology suite and access to our technology, uh, access to training on that technology. So you're not just you know, receiving technology over a fence, but actually implementing it into your workflows, driving efficiencies there. Uh, we have four different maker spaces across the United States and in, in the UK, uh, as well as 12,000 employees. And so how can we combine the human capital of an expertise of our employee base with the needs of our portfolio companies? That's all tremendously important within our own direct investing portfolio. But beyond, I think there has to be much more of a collaborative ecosystem approach if we're going to make all ships rise here. And so that's why I think partners with Shelter Tech and other organizations that are really focused on, on being the connective tissue for this space can help uh, us all collectively overcome the fragmentation that you traditionally see here between architects, engineers, construction managers, uh, owners, developers, financiers, and others. Even by nature of the diversity of this, you know, the, the panel and, and folks that spoke before, uh, those are vitally needed if we're going to get all ships to rise here. So. Um, not just direct investment portfolio, not just support to those mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, but there has to be sort of the connected tissue beyond. And we saw also before in the poll that there are a lot of, you know, other ecosystem supporters or entrepreneur supporters in the audience. And I would love to hear also their questions um, to this panel or the panel from before. So please write in the chat your questions or even if you're brave, just unmute yourself. We have still around six minutes to go um, until we already have to close this 90 minutes. Can John. I, um, yeah, I just want to add something here. Yes, you know, please. while we are seeing a lot, many disruptive startups, they come with a fairly uni unidimensional view to, to, to their solution. Disrupt the product and the application. But we've seen a phenomenal opportunity in COVID. Let me tell you what I'm saying. Uh, we tell startups who come into the forget funding now. We don't want you to raise funding. And we just mentored two startups today. We go through a very diligent process and we said, let's reinvent your business plans. So they used to go to real estate companies and they used to sell CapEx. <clears throat> now the beauty of the startup ecosystem is there are enough startups in the financing space who are ready to finance CapEx for our startups. So the minute you went into a SaaS model or water as a service model, or clean as a service model, the, 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 the dynamics have changed. Builders are now saying, 
hey, are you kidding me? You don't want me to pay a CapEx model? You don't want me to lock up tens of thousands of dollars? And we say no. And earlier, business models which were taking six months to close, now I kid you not, are being closed in a week to 10 days. So it's not just product disruption, it's also about business model disruption. And I think COVID again has opened the doors for startups and for us to see things very, very differently. So John, moving also forward, um, so we can actually scale more, more startups. How do you see, what is like, what, what do you think is the most important thing or the important things we have to do, you know, as Brigade or, or also um, other um, support systems to support entrepreneurs? So, so Lizanne, I think, you know, you did a poll and the poll said startups are looking for funding and that's what research, even our research said. And we categorically tell startups, you want funding, don't waste our time. We believe that startups must build, must have solutions which are monetizable and Brigade opens its doors to give these startups POCs which are paid. They become the guinea pig. They, they give you an environment and we handhold them and we get startups to deliver what they commit. There's a, whole, there's a large problem in real estate. Startups come in and they promise the moon to get your business. Three months later, the startup is disappointed, the real estate company is disappointed, and there goes the future for all startups. So we tell startups, come to us with must-have solutions, or we'll help you create that. Then we'll go to Brigade, which is the guinea pig, and the Brigade leadership team is completely bought into what we do. And once Brigade signs off, saying that, hey, this startup is tested, their value prop delivers us 12% greater efficiencies in construction, 14% savings in water, 32% savings in snags, we then take them to other real estate companies. And then it's a chain effect. So we tell startups, four months with us, forget funding. Funding is a byproduct of building a sound business model. And that's how Brigade is helping. Thank you very much, John. We are already running out of time. So I would like to ask uh, the last question to all of you. Um, Linus, what do you wish for the audience or for your fellow entrepreneurs, um, you know, after COVID? Linus? Uh, sorry, you'd have to repeat the question, Lizanne. I wasn't, sure. it wasn't very clear. After, after, you know, like now moving forward into the future, um, what what do you wish also your your fellow entrepreneurs? How can they success as a, be successful? No, I think it's about being agile and about being uh, uh, adaptive to uh, the new the new opportunities that uh, COVID pre presents. Um, I think it's also about uh, being intimately aware of uh, the changing needs of of your market and customers so that you're not in love with your product or your idea and you're still pushing it you know, down the throat of customers. So I think uh, COVID calls for a lot of agility and a lot of um, you know, being able to, to adapt to the situation. Uh, as John said, whether it is business models or um, whether it is actual product that you're pivoting. So I think uh, that, is, that, that would be my advice to uh, fellow entrepreneurs. Thank you so much. Sriram, what would be your advice? Yeah, I think uh, just like Lina said, it's more of staying agile and uh, that is the beauty of a startup to stay agile and just innovate and uh, grab on opportunities that comes by. So yeah, keep your ears and eyes open. I think that's pretty much it. Thank you. Ryan, do you have something powerful to end this panel? You know, I, I think that we've touched a lot of different uh, topics on this in terms of what success post COVID looks like. I think for the entrepreneurs, you know, obviously, you know, we mentioned, I, I totally agree with you know, thinking from first principles, being obsessed with your customer and their changing needs. Um, that evolution is happening now. And I think those that are adaptable and, and really uh, great active listeners and great at taking action based on those insights are going to do fantastic things and become potentially you know, the biggest companies of the next 10 years. A lot of that disruption is happening now. I mean, I think for the investors and the ecosystem partners, I think there's a wonderful opportunity to think creatively here. 
about the financing mechanisms. There was a little bit of a discussion around blended finance before and, and how to use that to align incentives. And then John was just mentioning about the importance of de-risking innovations you know, through customer pilots and all that is can be reshuffled today. And, and those that are thinking creatively, I think will help to enable those you know, sort of market defining companies that are gonna be born of this time. So I, for one, of course, it's a very challenging time, but but do feel that there uh, is a wonderful window of opportunity to be able to reshuffle what the future can look like, and a lot of that activity is happening within, you know, the the boxes of this Zoom call today. So uh, I'm leaving quite optimistic. Thank you, Ryan. John, something, ten seconds to add. Yeah. So startups should focus on building businesses for the sake of building a business and not chase venture funding. Uh, everything else should be a byproduct of just being so focused on building a good product that's, that actually does uh, a lot of service both to the real estate industry and to the environment. And we're seeing a lot of bright startups coming up. So I think just stay focused on, on building a business. Everything else will follow. Thank you so much. Thank you very much um, to all the panelists. And Mira, I'll give the word to you. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. I just want to say that uh, we, you can hear more from uh, more on the housing segment tomorrow and on Friday in these uh, sessions. Um, thank you for all the participation and the uh, panelists and the moderators. Have a good evening. Bye.